yeah, welcome to everyone who's here today. This is lovely. It's very intimate, very up close and personal, and um, the opposite on the internet, but hello regardless to uh, all the people in the world. Uh, so yeah, we're here today partly to talk about this uh, exhibition that's behind me now. So uh, Mess collaborated with the Australian Music Vault to curate this cabinet of... Um, I won't call it a cabinet of curiosities because that trivialises a little bit. It's a, it's a cabinet of amazing artefacts, I think, uh, that, that range from various pockets of the history of Australian electronic music. I'll say a little bit about Mess firstly and about the installation before introducing the incredible Nicole Skeltis. Well, actually, I'll introduce her now. So uh, Nicole Skeltis is 50% um, of the legendary uh, techno group from the 90s, Biff Tech, and one of the very early uptakes, um, uptakers of cl the Clan Analog Collective, uh, and is 100% of the amazing artificial moniker. So 50% of 100% of the other, that's 150%, which is pretty <laughs> impressive. Um, Nicole's had an absolutely stunning career, uh, was instrumental in, in helping us to get Mess started, and has been a really core cool member of the team, actually. Um, uh, yeah, so it's really wonderful to have Nicole here. And then we have the incredible, inimitable, I like to say, Matt Watson, uh, who's an extraordinary ele electronic musician um, and drummer. <laughs> I can't forget that. Can't forget that. Yeah, and he actually brings those together really beautifully in projects like Other Places and, um, and others. I won't go through all of your monikers because we don't have time. But, <laughs> but uh, Matt was also an integral part of the start of Melbourne Electronic Sound Studio and was the inaugural uh, studio manager who shepherded the organisation through its first, might I say, turbulent uh, six years. So wonderful to have you here as well, Matt. Thank you, Rob. And, um, and so Nicole will be talking about her incredible career um, and Matt will be addressing really primarily this graphic score that's behind us here, which was, uh, Matt was the, I'm going to say inaugural a lot, the inaugural uh, commissioned composer for the Melbourne um, Synthesizer Orchestra, which I like to say is the new MSO or the real MSO. It's the MSO that's going to take over from the current MSO. And if I keep saying that enough, then millions of dollars will flood to mess. Um, so I'm just going to keep manifesting that. So um, the Mess Synthesizer Orchestra was a huge collection of instruments. We, we decided to do a mass mobilisation of the collection, basically, and, and sort of put an extraordinary array of instruments on stage. Uh, and Matt, being the studio manager at the time, was and, and also a brilliant composer, that was the perfect storm to get Matt to compose for that particular constellation. And um, he did an absolutely brilliant job. So for those of you out in the world particularly who don't know what MESS is, I'm just going to talk really briefly about what MESS is. So MESS, the Melbourne Electronic Sound Studio, is what I like to call a, a genre agnostic haven of creativity for anybody who wants to make or experience electronic sound. And what we do is that we make available the entire history of electronic music in instrumental form to anybody who wants to come and, and partake in that. We have managed to leverage a phenomenal collection, probably one of the, one of the largest publicly accessible collections um, anywhere in the world, of um, instruments ranging from a theremin made by theremin himself in New York in the 1930s all the way through to the most current synthesizers of the day. Uh, and the idea is that you can uh, subscribe and you can come down and you can use any of these machines, some of which are incredibly rare, um, some of which are kind of ridiculously prohibitively expensive now. There's a strange stock market of synthesizers that seems to be skyrocketing in certain areas at the moment. Uh, so basically that's what MESS is. Some people call it a gym for synths where you come down and work out on, on synths, you, get, you know, take out a membership. But we're really keen to avoid what I call the aspirational spend, which is, you know, buying the membership or the subscription and then never actually showing up, which is what happens with most gyms. So... Um, if you are interested, please come down. We're in North Melbourne underneath the meat market. Um, all the details, obviously, online for how you can get involved. So I'll talk a little bit about the cabinet itself. And I'm just going to keep... Uh, I was going to keep a keen eye on the time, but... Um, oh, there it is. Oh, someone was so thoughtful. It's actually where I can see it. I thought I was going to have to do that. Um, because we do only have an hour and we do want to leave time for questions at the end, I'm going to race through a little bit so that we can hear from our guests. But I do, do just want to contextualise what we're looking at here in the cabinet and... Um, I used the term genre agnostic earlier and I think it's a very important part of the mess ethos. I think electronic music has, has become and can become kind of associated only with EDM, electronic dance music, and it can be, can be maligned at times um, 
with with, uh, with drug culture and things like that. So I think a big part of the mess remit is to educate, um, educate not just people I think, but you know governments and other funding organisations about the creative value of electronic music and the fact that it is now the most ubiquitous um, music making art form around. And so this cabinet really reflects that. So I, you know we we have. Uh, objects in this cabinet that um, are taken from the incredible history of innovation in Australia that uh, that you know the contributions that Australian innovators have made to the history of electronic music is quite profound and I mean particularly the Fairlight CMI we have some paraphernalia from that instrument here the Fairlight computer music instrument which really did redefine the way people worked with um, sampled sound and was the proto digital audio workstation an incredible achievement and um, one that isn't really recognised enough as, as a great Australian achievement. Um, we also have some amazing pieces in this cabinet here. There's a big silver box behind me, which is um, we call the Optronics unit. But in the bottom right-hand side of that, there's actually uh, a VCS-1. And the VCS-1, synth synthesizer aficionados are probably familiar with the VCS-3. So the VCS-3 was a, a synthesizer that came out of the UK and was responsible for really making electronic music accessible to a, to a much broader um, a community through its um, accessible price point, actually. So analog synthesizers at that time were often the province of universities. They were large, cumbersome and expensive systems. And um, uh, this, this VCS-1 that's behind us now is one of only three that was made. And the, the story goes quite famously now that Don Banks, an Australian uh, composer, who was a classical music composer but was interested in um, crossing over into the world of electronic music at the time, and he, he actually threw down 50 pounds on a, on a pub table in London and said, build me a portable synthesizer. And um, Peter Zanoffi of David Cockerell and Tristram Carey were the three people at that table. And they then went, they, they designed this unit, which is now in the Powerhouse Museum. They call it the Don Banks Music Box. But it's since then become known as the, um, the VCS-1. And um, he actually just wanted a synthesizer that he could play in bed. That's what he wanted. So it was a small... He wanted something that he could take to bed with a set of headphones. And so they sort of built this, they, they, they sketched it out on a napkin. I've got a photograph of that napkin. I'm not sure where its physical manifestation is, but we do have a photograph of it at Mess, a beautiful piece of ephemera. Um, uh, and that, that really kick-started the company. So the, they, once they'd built this little portable box, they thought, oh, maybe we should you know, take this a bit further and ended up building the VCS-3. So once again, this, there's this sort of Australian connection to a very fundamental and important part of the electronic music story. And the only reason, I, I, I actually despise parochialism and nationalism, I'm not a nationalist, but the reason that I like to talk about these Australian connections and these Australian innovations is that as an artist who grew up in Australia, I'm keenly aware of the fact that we don't think things happen here, that we have this very, very, um, entrenched belief that culture comes from elsewhere and of course it doesn't it's here and it's alive and as a as a practicing artist i think it's very important to to make this point that incredible things can happen here we don't we don't need to be looking elsewhere so it's not a, it's not an act of ridiculous nationalism it's just more about making sure that the the, the many and various histories that are, that are out there are told and are told effectively. So we have everything in here from this unit right behind me, the Trans Audio 3 Oscillator unit was actually rescued from a dumpster when La Trobe University Music Department was closed in the late 1990s. Um, so that's that very rare piece made here in Australia in the 70s and we have the ETI which is the um, Electronics Today International magazine um, this one behind me in the, in the wooden enclosure you actually bought as a, as a kit set with a, with a magazine. Uh, the magazine was actually started by one of the founders of Fairlight. Uh, over here we have a, you know, a sampler used by Nick Cave in the Bad Seeds, of course, you know, so we could probably clone the band from that, from the sweat and whatever's gone into that instrument, the little discs that they used to um, make the ship song there. Uh, and I'll get Nicole to talk about the drum, drum machine over on the far side when the time comes. But um, one of my favourite things actually though is at the very front of the cabinet, and have a look at this when, uh, after we've had this talk, is uh, a toy synthesizer called the Muson, which I've heard rumours that it was actually um, designed by Serge Cherupman, the very famous um, synth pioneer of Serge synthesizers. 
but apparently he never admitted to it. But it's a tiny toy from the 70s, and I always thought that if I had my hands on that in the 70s, my, my obsession with this stuff would have been completely fast-tracked. It's a completely mad little machine with a little step sequencer and makes all kinds of crazy sounds. But the reason it's in this exhibition, the, the, the Australian significance, is that um, uh, an amazing artist came here from the States in the mid-70s, Warren Burt, and has been here ever since, uh, making a huge contribution and having a great influence on a great many artists, including myself. But he had a duo called Plastic Platypus in the 1970s, which performed a lot at a place called the Clifton Hill Community Music Centre, which was, which was a real hub for experimental music activity in the 1970s. And, and he and another composer called Ron Nagorka, they had one of these each, and they would go head to head in these very, very strange kind of electronic music improvisations. And one of the things that Warren Burt was so instrumental in teaching me as a young artist is that incompetence can be completely instructive. So he took this idea, he, he really dismantled the idea of um, the terrible term mastery of things and was really interested in exploring things and, and accepting that, you know, being able to do something that you're not brilliant at is actually a great way to unlock a whole lot of really amazing music. And I thought, I thought that was very ins inspirational. So that's why I, I really had to include something of Warren's um, sort of mind. And it's, it's beautiful that it's a little toy. But um, I might throw to Matt Watson now, first and foremost, to just take us through the experience of being confronted, I guess, with the idea of writing music for such, an, such a, a huge collection of instruments. And talk us through a little bit, if you can, the, the graphic language that you've actually been working on for quite some time for electronic sound. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Robin. Um, so I, I guess when, when I was asked... Yeah, when I was commissioned, when I was given that opportunity to, to it was put on the table to write for the, uh, the very first um, outing of the Mess Synthesizer Orchestra. I'm not sure there was much instruction really given. It was just do this. And I kind of went away having spent a lot of time in the, um, in the Mess studio, uh, obsessing over all of the gear and um, talking to everyone that came through the door about all of the, th the synths every day very passionately and forcing myself to learn about them uh, uh, every day. I guess I, I, I kind of, yeah, when that opportunity came, I kind of knew straight away what I wanted to do with it. Like, it was like looking at my family, knowing where all the families sit. Like, you know, and I could just kind of like, or, or like, a, um, you know, someone writing for a big, someone uh, uh, well-versed in writing for string orchestras or big, symphony orchestras, understanding how to position everything. So for me, um, I knew that I wanted to use as many of the key instruments from the collection as possible. So I immediately chose the Moog System 55 and the Buchla 200, 200E um, system. Um, you know, the, the CMI Fairlight was in there. Um, the VCS, two VCS3s, which I considered to be my gatekeepers. So they were originally um, positioned uh, either side of the stage, in my mind at least, and they were going to be like a, a, like a force field for the stage. They were going to kind of like protect everyone on the stage. This is in my mind, the, the, I guess, the way I was thinking about it. Um, so, yeah, first and foremost, when the opportunity came about, I, I just selected all the instruments, did some initial tests, realised that a couple of the ideas I had probably weren't going to work and then just reconfigured, but I didn't change too much from my initial instinctual response. Um, um, I guess from there, you know, how do you manage such a big collection of instruments um, on stage with people who, in this case, like I, I wanted, or I select, the people I selected to be in the orchestra were people that weren't necessarily virtuosic on the instruments that I paired them with and I really liked that idea as well um, and it kind of ties in with what you were saying before um, remembering when I first got my AKS and started working with that machine that it was um, all those exciting kind of noodles that happened early on you know and that were the things that excited me the most so I wanted people to be kind of exploring the machines as they were learning the piece the piece magnitudes came out well that that's half of it that the, the graphic image in there, that's kind of half of the piece. So 
I, I, I guess I kind of thought, so tell me if, I, if, if you want to inter no, no, interject no. at any time. No, no please. Okay. Please. Um, <laughs> uh, I, for me, it was out of necess uh, a necessity to kind of come up with a, a way to manage 16 people on instruments they may not necessarily know how to be proficient in. Some, every, everyone was very proficient, but not specifically in the machines they were paired with. Um, how am I going to manage a 40-minute piece, or in this case, like 30, 35-minute piece, in basically six rehearsals? You know, like it would take six rehearsals just to work out how to get that system to work together. Um, so, you know, this, this uh, like writing or kind of composing in this way using a graphic score, it was out and, and yeah, it, was, it was a necessary um, uh, decision to make because I needed to communicate ideas very quickly and effectively. So, you know, the big kind of brown and, and yellow circle, I mean, that's the surge solo in the middle. So that's David Chesworth. Um, and that seemed to fit, you know, there's, there's, um, uh, you know, there's, there's kind of uh, movements and lines and colours and kind of compartmentalised sections which indicate, oh, if I say to um, uh, um, yeah, uh, Nina and Jana, you know, uh, who were on the VCS3s, like, you are this colour or this bit, when we get here, this is your time and everything's timelined, it makes sense. And we've, obviously there's another layer to the composition and that is the, the more kind of minutiae of it. But that's, I guess that's, in a nutshell, that's kind of how I thought about it was piece, selecting the instruments, choosing the people, thinking about it in this kind of larger, more broad strokes kind of form. Um, the other thing I was thinking about today too was, like I could have done anything with those machines, and a lot of, if any, like a lot of the stuff that I like is not always um, necessarily that palatable to like a more kind of broader or mainstream audience. Um, and I could have done stuff which was way more kind of atonal and kind of way more nuts, really. And the big part of me wanted to do that, but the piece was written in response to the curation. There was curated to be at the Sydney My Music Bowl. And the, bowl, the history of the bowl is one of bringing people together, not one of, like, isolation. It's not one to say, like, you can watch me, but you can't talk to me or touch me. And I like the idea of, like, writing a piece that was... Um, that really brought people in. So it was, you know, lush, quite a luscious work. It was very kind of, you know... You know, it had structure. I'd, I'd actually almost describe it as pastoral. Like, yeah. it, it had a very symphonic feel, which I thought mm. was such an achievement, actually, because, I mean, my first instinct of thinking about that huge collection of instruments is how am I going to clock all these together? And you just, you used humans, which mm. is obviously the most musical answer to that question, you know? You know and, and I think that that was, uh, for me, that was a big part of it, the way that you actually created an ensemble and conducted an ensemble of players. Mm. I think that really answered that. So, and I've got a really simple response to that, like why I chose humans to clock. It's because the first, not the first synth I bought, but the first synth um, that was like my gateway to this world that kind of unlocked everything was the synthy AKS. And the most beautiful part of that instrument is that it has, has the KS, which is the keyboard sequencer. And it's not a grid sequencer. It, it, it records voltage over time. And you you know you play your movements in it and, it and it plays back of those movements those human movements, and there's no nothing compares to that. I, I like there's no, no there's not another instrument that I that I'm aware of that can produce that same effect of playing a phrase in. And I should say based on the timbral quality of the instrument and all the other stuff that make it special, but I feel like that having spent you know a long time with that instrument prior. To doing this, it, it, um, that was the seed. I think I like the idea of human controlled or human clocking is, mm. is special. And can you just talk a little bit about your your arrival at this graphic language? Because mm. I know it's something you've been thinking about for a long time. Do you, I mean, can you elaborate on why you're drawn to these graphic representations of electronic sound? Um. <laughs> I, I'm, 
I probably can't... I, I don't have a really clear answer to that. I, I, I read a quote... I think, it was, I think it was actually a Frank Zappa quote, and it was about graphic scores, and it was a classic Frank Zappa line of basically just saying, well, it's for people who don't know how to write music. Fair enough. Like, I have, I have some very kind of arbitrary um, um, uh, you know, musical training. I, I went to music school. I did music theory for many years. But I'm not... That's not me, you know. I'm, I don't make music in that way. I can use those elements to piece... ..to work on, on music to ev evolve and expand it, as I did with this. But I think there's something really beautiful about graphic language that allows you just to kind of you know, close your eyes and think of, like, you know, when you close your eyes and think of music, you're often... You're not thinking in, like, a stave and, you know, black and white keys. And you're not thinking in those terms. It's an energy, it's a feeling, and it's, a, it's that idea of elevation, movement, motion, you know, colour, all manner of things. It's not claiming synesthesia. It's just a human thing to know. You know when you feel good if you're on a dance floor. You know when you feel good if you're seeing a band or any, any music, an orchestra or whatever. So I think being able to kind of articulate what that might feel like in terms of shape, time and colour is a really profoundly strong way to connect with people and bring people in and not make them feel like they can't join the club. <laughs> yeah, it's an incredible shorthand, really, mm. for communicating yeah. exactly those feelings. And in the same way that Tristram Carey refused to initially to have a keyboard associated with the VCS3... Mm there is this sort of sense with electronic musical instruments and their development over time that we did need a new language mm. for these new sounds. So, yeah, it does make a lot of sense in that regard as well. Well, that's the East Coast West versus the West Coast. Yeah, I was like talking West struggle. Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> West Coast are more fun. Everyone had more fun over there, right? Bukla and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't need a keyboard to... That, that restricts you. To, to how you think about music and how you think about sound. Mm. Cause you, but Moog um, made it um, for musicians that he knew and they were wanting something that they could actually play in their bands and stuff. And so mm. it turned out to be the, the East Coast that won in the end in terms of popularity and synthesizers and what we now see here. Um, but um, but, but get, getting back to your, your score, I <laughs> I'll go, clock it. The human clock. I've just mm. got this image in my mind now. It's like <laughs> lining up human clocks to be... <laughs> that, that's an electronic uh, geek talking about how, like, musicians work, I think, you know. <laughs> like, we... I think, I think the earlier uh, d discussion of that... Well, n description of that is you get into the... You get into the zone, you get into the groove, you know. Like particularly, with, as a drummer, you know this. Yeah. You just sound so. I am the human well, clock. I've been the human clock for a long you, you time. Have been, you are the human. You could just say to a human clock. And I, I was a very, very lucky. I've been uh, ha hanging out with these beautiful people for a number of years now. And I was uh, able to play at the, at the bowl on this momentous event when we saw the uh, uh, Melbourne Synthesizer Orchestra in its debut. And, um, but I do remember, like, uh, 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 I was sitting in the audience. And um, my partner and I were just sitting there, we're listening to it, things tune up, and we're just like, barking hell. It was just so discordant. It was really like, just like, whew, you know, <laughs> this is going to be like a screech fest. Mm. And, and, and it's going to be like a whole bunch, of, this could be really alienating. <laughs> you know, if you go there, and it was just so loud and so painful. That was my favourite. Because bit. these machines, they have no. <laughs> They weren't designed for pop music or anything. They just they just do their thing, and, and there's all this huge, loud, discordant screeching sounds and stuff. And it's like, oh my god, is that what's going to be? We, we, <laughs> this is going to be like this war on the audience and, that and we're going to have. And then, <laughs> and then I'm going to come on later and just go like, hi everybody, I'm like the dance rave queen, and I'm just going <laughs> to jump around and make you feel better after that. But no, it was great. It was just, and it, just it was so emotionally moving. And I think this is where I might. This I think this is a whole discussion about um, my. Everyone's got their own entry into electronic music, and I have got like virtually no training in music at all, really. Uh, but it, but it's kind of a punk sensibility in the sense you didn't have to know how to play guitar. You could just pick one up and. You just dance around and have an attitude, and you just like the sound and the whole thing. And so, and and electronic music eventually became that. When it became affordable, literally, you mm. could just go down and and find drum machines and 
Um, that is that literally, you know, where it all sort of came from in terms of the dance music. It was affordable, it was easy. You didn't have to have a degree or know what you're doing. You could just get there and just get into the sounds and have these really basic like pulses and stuff. And that's where I come from. So, you know, um, and so that's where I came from in, in um, the early, in the mid 90s with myself and another girl. And there weren't a whole lot of girls doing it at, at the time. There probably were, there were probably heaps, but we just didn't hear about them. It was kind of before the internet was on computers. And um, so, we, so myself and Kate were getting together in, um, in, the, early, in the mid to mid 90s. And it was part of a, a group called, can you see over there, this, like the, can you see so, a picture of um, Bob Moog? It's actually Bob here. It's a blue poster and the over there it's called Electronic. So Bob Moog is the West Coast guy who eventually developed synthesis into something that was um, keyboard based and affordable and that, that's probably what most people associate with synthesizers now. And um, so that was the early collective. It was myself and a bunch of people in Canberra and Sydney in the mid-90s and um, at that time it was absolutely a kind of um, punk aesthetic in the sense that you could go to your local op shop and you could find TB303s, you could find 808s, you could find 909s and that's where my collection came from. You could just go down and you could just find this stuff because they were kind of discarded relics from this earlier time of electronic innovation. And uh, the sound of acid, <laughs> like that, that sound is 303. And, and, and the, the hilarious <laughs> history of some of these instruments is that somebody made this, and I've got the manual from it, which is like, this is how you program like a, a seriously long like, funk bass line for it. Or this is how you can like program a bit of bark. You know, <laughs> it's like, this thing, which he can hardly understand. Have you ever seen the original promo images for the 606 and 303? It's no. O it's Oscar Peterson sitting there behind his piano with a 606 and 303 saying these are the great practice tools. Basically, they're practice tools. Little did he know. For what? For exactly. For jazz. Yeah, for, for jazz. jazz. Yeah. And, then, and this is even before you had things which were able to bend the, the sink so that you had a bit of a swing in the feel of things. So these are like metronomic things that you're supposed to somehow make into the bass lines for these incredibly <laughs> complex <laughs> funk. But I remember, so no wonder I they were fairly quickly discarded. Well, they, didn't, they didn't get anywhere. But, but, uh, but Well, you took them amazing places, but the, the, um, one of the first things that came out of your garage when mess started was this amazing box I think you've got the it back now. The synchronizer. The swinger, the, the the MIDI swing box. Can you? What was what was that? But that's part of the whole kind of late nineties, early two thousands, and it continues. There's a there's people like myself who are absolutely zero technical ability, but but you're into the music and the sounds. And then you've got this whole kind of geek culture, which is around the mods, you know, just modding stuff and and and, and just making box and electronic gizmos and stuff. So we have this beautiful, um, uh, you know, synergetic relationship. And there was a guy in um, Sydney at the time who was um, making uh, boxes that would turn these metronomic uh, uh, early drum machines, you know, pre eight, up to the 808, um, into things that would have a little bit of a swing to them. And then you, it wasn't MIDI, it was like DIN sync. So you'd, you'd sync them to other, you know, lots of cables going everywhere. Um, and um, yeah, I had one of those. And um, actually, a friend, one of my friends from those those times, had just released an album called The Swinchronizer, <laughs> and um, <laughs> which is a bit like, oh, thank you. And it is honestly just beautiful. It's a beautiful, and it's all still using this early anal early attempts to make these early machines, which were highly um, rigid in their feeling as a drummer you know what i'm talking about yeah it's, the, it's always the battle it's like you you know you you're in the the human world and you crave some machine music and you get into the machine world and you crave a little how do you get the human touch in there but it makes all the difference and so you, you can't like house music by definition has got that swing in it and and that, that the house music was absolutely dependent upon the 808, sorry, the 909, which was um, finally got this, you could actually press this button, which would give it a bit of swing. And it started to um, give it that shuffle that we all know and love and can't really resist, really. 
And uh, so that that's the sort of the world I came from, I guess. Can you just talk a little bit more? You say you didn't you didn't have any musical background or anything. Not and I re- really. And you have said to me before, it, when I've complimented your music before, you've just in a very offhanded way say, well, the machines do all the work. Mm. So it was that um, part of your, like, gateway into being a musician, which you are now in all kinds of other forms and ways, was your gateway into that, the fact that these machines facilitated that for you? Yes, I think, I think they were. And I think it was... Um, uh, it's hard to emphasise how empowering it was to think that you can get all these machines <laughs> as limited as they were there with all the cables you'd had to run between them all and um, their limited thinking and they had like eight mega memories like whew, that seemed like a lot you know but <laughs> and the sampling and stuff but they um uh if you if you hook them all up, then then you just let them go, literally. And the and the um, first albums that I put together with myself and Kate, and and I was doing stuff with Kate Crawford as Biff Tech, and then I was doing stuff um, solo as artificial, because that was much more crazy. So I had my kind of slightly more conformist stuff, and then I had stuff that was completely out there. Um, and uh, it would um, we did it all live in in a sense that electronic music is live. You just get it all going. And you just get the machines all clocked up together and you just do, you run around with the knobs and you just try and get that sample and you go around and get it all happening. You've got the DAT player running and it's like all sounding really, really good and all the levels are really, really good. And you go, oh, I get almost at the end, it's like, I accidentally turned something up too loud or, you know, <laughs> oh, fuck, I turned... <laughs> that was a wrong preset. You know, start all over again. So, so you have to... So all the um, BivTech and all the artificial stuff from that, that late 90s, early 2000s stuff... Um, is pre is pre um, multi channel recording, which is almost impossible for anyone to imagine now, I guess. But it was um, it is as live as it's as live as you can get, <laughs> I guess. From could that you time. could you take us through Clay and Analog a little bit for for anybody who doesn't know what Clay and Analog is? Yeah, so um, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm here today and surrounded by these magnificent people and this magnificent space and these incredible cushions. Um, uh, and mess, like, you know, it's because people uh, in over time have got together and supported each other. It's not exactly a lucrative um, career and it's not exactly a whole lot of emotional and um, artistic support or, or even government support for, for this stuff. And so um, I came across um, this group of people in Sydney and Canberra in the early 90s and they were just a bunch of artists who just said, like, we love electronic music, we just love all these old machines that you can find in, you know, charity shops and stuff like that. We just love it. And we also loved the sounds that were coming out of Detroit and Berlin and London and all that kind of late 80s, early 90s rave culture. And um, no support for that at all, zero in Australia. And the only way you could could, um, get a gig or release anything was to cooperate. And also, because we had no money, you also had to share machines. So we shared machines, we shared technology, uh, we released a whole bunch of um, stuff on cassette and vinyl, and then eventually um, CDs. And so that is an electronic arts collective, Clan Analog. Um, it's, it's still going today. So what's that, 30 years now? Yeah. And so that, but, but that, that's what attracted me to the whole thing too, because I think there's something bigger than just the, just you know the sounds. I think it's about the spirit um, behind music and why people. Um, uh, we we need each other as musicians. We need we need that spirit of cooperation and, and inspiration, and community. Mm. So that was very attractive to me, and that's why I got together with them. Yeah, because I guess electronic music has a tendency, or the creation of it has, well, not the tendency, but at least the possibility built into it of completely atomizing people. In, you think so? Yeah, in the sense that you can just be on your own and you can create the whole thing yourself and you don't need anybody now. else, you know. So this idea that, and I think Mess is very much about this idea of bringing Community. people together yeah, and making music together, which is the thing that is much more amazing than making music on your own. So that was uh, in Canberra at the time. I remember you saying that was the, that was the creation of context, really, wasn't it? There was no context for for the music that you wanted to make. So Clan Analog was became the context, and they became family in a way to you. Yes, they were. Yeah, hmm. definitely. 
And again, before the internet was on computers, like if you wanted to know how to, why you couldn't get something to stick to something else or why you couldn't get the, your Akai sampler to do what it should be doing with the filters, like you had to ask people and you, and you had to like share information and we did literally share machines mm. in the way that MESS is sharing now. So it's, it's kind of continuation of that spirit. It's like if you want to access this stuff, not everyone can afford, well, it's ridiculously expensive now, mm. but, you know, but still you can't access stuff unless someone allows you to explore these machines. And so we were just lucky to be of a time where we just found this, all this stuff, you know, literally in some people's attics. <laughs> and I, I do remember like the Korg MS-20, which I've since sold to Byron, like at this guy, when I found it, it was like $100 or something. And he said, he said, if you take this, you can sound like Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of that like generation of the prog rock people who were just going, wow, we're just into this stuff. And then it sort of went and kind of died and then became something else uh, mm. after that, what synthesizers represented culturally and what you could do with them. And you've still got your collection of incredible Most machines. Most of it, yeah. yeah. And so you're, are you, you're coming back to it now after a, after a period of separation? Um, yes, um, did you say family? Like reconnecting with your family? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're our family, aren't mm. they? We, we, know what, we know what they do. Yeah. yeah we know, we know, you know, know them intimately, you know, know how they respond in certain yes. situations, <laughs> you can manage them, yes. they manage you. Yeah. Ma manipulate they take maintenance. us. <laughs> so definitely, I've, I've got, um, I, I've got, I, le I lent it to me for mess for a little bit, and uh, well, actually, quite a few years, I guess. Yeah. Um, no, they're back home now. And um, so I've done a whole lot of different music um, over the years. Um, but recently I've just done a uh, rock opera. Mm -hmm. And that in, it's not just rock. It does involve a bit of rock, agitprop sort of punk. But it's, um, it involves quite a lot of electronic stuff. And it involves the old-fashioned stuff. And I'm very proud of a track that um, myself and my partner here, Bill, and uh, an another very dear collaborator, a guitarist, also a great pedal. There's a whole thing that's come up, like a whole pedal, guitar pedals. You know, it's not just keyboards, electronics, like the whole world, the people who do these boutique guitar pedal things, that's another whole yeah. amazing geek universe. Um, uh, we did like a whole kind of Noi harmonium tribute track, which went on for about 25 minutes and we didn't stop. And then we got to the end of it and was like, oh, that worked. Oh my God, that worked. So some of that material um, is in the rock opera as well. And so we're releasing that. Um, I've done a little DIY film for it and it's showing at Thornbury Picture House um, this Saturday. Still a few tickets left. Highly recommend. It's, oh, very, highly it's very recommend. political. Highly it's recommend. It's not for the faint hearted. It's amazing. It's, it's called Canary <laughs> Wharf and it's a rock opera about the stock market. The finance industry, yeah. Yeah, it's wild. Go on yeah. Saturday if you, if you can. Lovely theatre too if you've never been to the Thornbury Picture House. Shout out to them. Amazing. The shout out. Uh, Thornbury Picture House have a hugely supportive of music docos. Mm. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Lovely, yeah. Um, are we up to the Q&A now? Not quite. What time is it? <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite. Not, we're not quite there. Aren't we? Huh? Can, you, can you just say a couple of more things about Canary Wharf before I move on? Like, how did it come about? Why, why are you writing a rock opera about the stock market or the finance market? That's, I mean, that's got to be a good question, right? Yes, it's, it's not necessarily connected with electronic music as such, though. Um, no, that's, that's okay. Okay, so I lived in London for almost seven years, and um, I guess it's always... I guess there's a continuing thread, uh, and this is something maybe we can discuss a bit later. Like, is electronic music, by definition, kind of apolitical? Because it's because it's got no words. Yeah, that's just a question. You know, um, I don't think so. But um, uh, you can't live in London and watch the deterioration of that society under the political uh, catastrophes that have been going on there, um, uh, and see what's going and the dark, dark shadow that's cast over that society by <coughs> the finance industry. And it, it's even got a name, it's called the finance curse. It crowds out all 
aspects. It cra literally crowds out all other um, aspects of the economy. And it um, has massive tax breaks and it's completely corrupted the political system and it throws this, um, uh, even Canary Wharf as being this, um, the second city. It's, it was a Thatcher vision. You just, just the docklands were destroyed um, after the, 80, the uh, 70s and the 80s and all the uh, working class industries pretty much got um, decommissioned in the UK. And then this whole like glittering edifice was like a tribute to global capitalism. It was like the, uh, the ultimate visual statement of what um, neoliberalism is all about and it was a, a haven for like this banks and, and media organisations, etc. It's, um, uh, and I, I, I was working quite close to there um, for many years in a, so the whole uh, precinct around there is called Tower Hamlets and I was working actually supporting people who work in uh, the NHS as trauma um, <coughs> surgeons and nurses. So it's one extreme to the other. I just step over literally the, the people who are lying in the gutter literally every day. And then I had a partner who was working in Canary Wharf at the time. He's working for Thomson Reuters, the media organisation. I go down there and it was just like, whew. you couldn't see a more dramatic contrast between the 1% and what was going on elsewhere. So I just um, uh, felt that I needed to write something about this. And um, so I came up with an idea for writing a rock, rock opera, as you do. Um, I was. Uh, <laughs> I think that's, a, I think as, that's, as the, that's the most curious choice, though. I mean, did you, had you just always wanted to write a rock opera? No, I hadn't. No, I hadn't. But but there's, but I have increasingly over my career, and maybe we can talk about this a bit later. And I actually spoke to you about this a couple of weeks ago. It's like I've just. Um, I moved away from purely electronic dance music um, in the early 2000s for a number of reasons, but one of them which is I wanted to work with lyrics and words, mm. and I wanted to start telling stories. Mm. And so this is kind of, so my last album was like a tribute to Bob Dylan. Um, not really a tribute, but an attempt to um, capture some of that um, high, 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 high benchmark of lyrical, political writing in music. And then, so where do you go after that? Well, why not? why not do a rock opera? Like, that's the next thing to do <laughs> in terms of telling a story. And um, I've always had a political bent. Like, I've spent a lot of time, you know, I'm sure we all have, you know, we've gone to protests, etc. and Biff Tech was going to endless protests, you know, pro bono stuff and you know, for all kinds of causes. And I've and, um, I spent a lot of money supporting causes. And so it's kind of consistent with my uh, artistic ethos. Um, now to do this, and so this is just a, a kind of political activist musical intervention, I mm. guess, and, uh, but telling a story. But it's also an intensely personal story because I lived in London for so long, and it would just seem. And I've got other amazing friends who are doing, uh, talking about finance and banking and globalisation in really, really clever ways mm. as artists. And so I was very inspired by that as a, as a way to be an artist, I guess. No, I think it's an extraordinary project and uh, you should be commended for it. Um, Matt, could you tell us a little bit about your musical journey as well? Because I know that you've, you've had your love affair with the Synthi AKS for a very long time, mm. but you've now developed a love affair with something called uh, Frap Tools. Can you, uh, oh. for, the, for the uninitiated, can you explain what's going on and why? Yeah, um, where do I start? So I'll, I'll start with the, the last thing first. So <laughs> the love affair with Frap Tools is, is, um, is, is Let's not, I mean, assume, let's not assume anybody knows what Frap Tools so is. So Frap right? Tools is an Italian company that make modular synthesizers um, in the spirit of Buchla uh, synthesizers. Buchla were really the, the, the first to make um, uh, modular systems or, or um, uh, modular synthesizers in, the, in the about 1963, 1964. Um, and in California, um, very, yeah very expansive um, way to create sound and move sound around. Frap tools are a modern take on that. Eurorack is a format, so just think of it as like, I don't know. Lego. Lego, right? Like all Lego fits together, you can buy different kits. So Eurorack is a format. Frap tools is one of a zillion companies that make modules for that format. Um, 
Uh, I fell in love with their modules because I couldn't afford a real Buchla. The Buchla that I want, or what I would love, would set you back many tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, that's unachievable. Um, what was achievable was to build a Fraptool system over a long period of time. Um, they sound pretty good. They're, they're not, like, they're not, they're never going to be Buchla good, but th they are really interesting as well. So, anyway, I, I'm obsessed with the clean aesthetics, so I just adopted for the, uh, the, the Fraptool system. Um, and you've just released an album, Reflective Hits, which yeah. is made entirely on that system? Is yeah, that? yeah. Or close to? Yeah, pretty much, yeah, made on that system. And there's a couple of other instruments in there as well. I use the polysynth and stuff like that um, to kind of create some, some contrast in there. Um, but the feature is very much that system. Um, yeah, very much in the spirit of, of that, that kind of Californian um, approach to modular synthesizers. So... Um, I could reel off a bunch of names, but it doesn't really matter. Um, it's a pretty abstract record. Like everything with me, I tend to kind of go into weird little rabbit holes. So the album is called Reflective Hits. I had the idea of, like, what would it be like if I was a post-war, um, gooey-hearted vocalist writing love songs on the back of, um, you know, a really traumatic period in history... So all the track names kind of sound like they belong on like an Al Bowley record or something. Like what are they? Um, oh, Come Now, Felstry. Um, <laughs> Br uh, Brenzo, uh, Brenzo, my friend. I can't remember all the names. But they've got like, <laughs> like the modules that I talk about them as my friends, kind of like right. their loved ones and friends that I'm bidding good farewell to. Wow. Yeah. It's a bit silly. I do yeah. love Al Bowley as well. So, you know, I have a love affair. Of, I do of love like a good concept album. Yeah. You anyway. go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Reflective Hits is, is, is – I've just released that um, uh, through Eternal Music Projects, which is a label I set up to facilitate the release of my own music but also other people's music. Um, so there's a bunch of releases set for this year. Hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. And I, I remember when Alessandro Cortini came to visit Mess, Alessandro is a member of the Nine Inch Nails but also a brilliant – uh, electronic musician in his own right, but he he said something hilarious about modular synthesis, which which I thought was quintessentially Italian, but I don't want to typecast somebody. But he did say that when he saw when he sees a mixed modular system, he just thinks it's going to taste terrible. It's like a bad. <laughs> yeah, I like agree. A, it's like a bad recipe or something. And he and he was talking about the fact that he really likes instruments, you know, that are that are designed to be played as instruments, and that anything that had this kind of hodgepodge going on was never really going to do do that for him. Like I, d I disagree with him in, in a lot of ways, but I just thought it was a really beautiful observation. And I'm wondering if you if you can see a through line between your early experience with the AKS, which is an integrated instrument. Mm. You know, it is modular, but it is this singular. It's mm. a very singular instrument. And I've watched you over the years go through the hodgepodge, and now you've sort of emerged from there at this sort of frap tool system. Do you see that there's a through line there? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll probably trace it back. I was the kid when I was a really young kid when I built Lego. Everything had to be colour matched. Mm, like yeah. the thing, it just depends on like, you know, I'd watch my friends who are complete psychos making trucks and graders and stuff out of like multicoloured Lego. I'm like, this made me crazy in my head. So, <laughs> so I think maybe there's something that that, says something about me but I do like I think for me it's about removing all opposition to clean creativity when I say clean to to like uh realizing your ideas and for me I don't want an enormous amount of visual stimulus I don't want to be kind of going what is this oh and navigating language and stuff when there's so much variation within these systems for me um I think uh, spending a lot of time on the MESS Buchla, the MESS 200-200E Buchla, like that was just set a lot of things in motion for me. So I think my system is very much built on the back and in fact mirrors much of that system. Um, I like the idea of my ideas having a clean, there's no resistance, they just come out and I can, I know that system inside out, I'm not thinking about like what do these bells and whistles do, I know how to extract an infinite variety of sounds out of every one of those modules. Mm. And there's, there's, a limited, there's, a, there's a limited number of modules. It's not like a thousand modules that do different things that ultimately all do the same thing. Mm. It's like 
it's a collection of functions, sound generators and functions, mm. individually that are capable of a really rich variety of sounds. So it's a way really of combating that option fatigue. Yes. Yeah, you've eliminated that. Yes. Mm. That's fantastic. So we've, with about 10 minutes left, I'm going to throw it open to the floor. It's always a great way to silence a room of people to ask if, if there are any questions. And there aren't many of you here, so you're all incredibly exposed. But um, uh, I'm sure that something's come up over the course of the last um, 45 minutes to, to warrant a question. We have one from, from Bill. Hello. Um, Matt, when you said you'd only rehearsed the MSOP six times before, mm. I mean, I, that's, that actually took me aback because it sounded very rehearsed. It sounded very um, designed. So how, had you already written the piece and did you have a, a, a clear understanding of how it would sound or really did that, really come out of the six sessions with all the artists you were working with? Uh, I, I, I'd written the piece. Uh, the final realisation of that work was, was the result of those six sessions and understanding how people would interpret some of those ideas. Um, I, I will acknowledge the secret weapon on that, um, on that performance was Biddy Connor, who held kind of first chair... Uh, on the SH5, all those del like gorgeous melodic lines that grabbed everyone. You, all credit to Biddy for that. So, um, so I had the 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 uh, cons you know the concept was sound, the instrumentation was sound, the 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 orchestra was sound, um, the timing, the shape, this what what we did was fill in fill all that in. So it was two weekend, informal weekend sessions, two Sundays, which were like four hours each. And then we went into five days at the channel um, here at the Arts Centre. And out of those five days, there was only two full days that we had everyone together to rehearse it. Everything else was sectional. And so we refined and worked on it. And then the end result far exceeded what I could have imagined. And that's the result of the people that were involved and giving people not being a total psycho about it and allowing people space to do, you know, still my show, my piece. <laughs> I want them, to, want them to play what I say. And, you know, I did design the patches on the modular, all the modulars and your tam tambral, tamberly, what was going on with the, the mono synths and stuff. But, you know, if people have good ideas, let them do that. And it makes, collectively, it makes for a better work. That's what I was going to say, like in terms of the limitations of, of um, traditional Western scoring for music, it's got no, it can't deal with timbre. Mm. And timbre and colour is the essence of electronic music. And the person, you know, it's, being able to allow the personalities to come out in the moment. Yeah, because... Which he, I think sometimes doesn't... Yeah, no, no, literally, time. you can't, how do you score that? You mm. can't score that any other way than, you have to figure it out. It, mm. literally through colour or shapes or mm. whatever, but it's not there in traditional you know, musical notation at all. Yeah. Gives, gives people licence to go nuts when they don't see, like, really strict language. They just go, oh, I'm that, like, fluoro colour <laughs> blob on the thing. This is my patch. Sweet. <laughs> Let's get to do this thing. And that's kind of what happened. It was, it was an amazing feat of organisation, though, I've got to say, Matt. It was really Hell yeah. commendable. It's my working yeah. class background. I know, I know how to get shit done. Like, <laughs> you, basic, you were basically, I can do basic stuff. You, you were shearing that orchestra, is that what you're no, saying? Well, no, well, <laughs> no. Sorry, I know your dad's a, your dad's a shearer. Yeah, he shook my hand the other day and he broke it? it off. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> He's still got it. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions? Surely. Hi, this is just a, a general question for all of you. Um, with um, everything opening up as far as like where sound is now accessible and how people are becoming more receptive to it, does that bring heaps of new ideas for how you can get sound and music out with electronic music? I'm thinking like public spaces and, or, and you know, installations and things like that. You're probably the best place to answer that, Robin. You've... That's your world. <laughs> um, 
Okay, yeah, I think it's, it's what's really heartening is to hear you say that it is opening up. <laughs> I think I think that has happened a lot. I think I think there's a lot going on in sound, but there's also um, sort of this uh, there's a t there's a tendency towards a homogeneity as well that I think we have to combat. And I think that the tools that we're delivered and the stories that we're told, partly actually by the machinery of the music industry, can be really reductive and really, um, yeah, hom homogenizing basically. And so, what I like to think that MESS does is op offers people the opportunity to come and get back in their ears with electronic sound, which I think is the most important thing, as we were just talking about before. Out of out of the drop down menus, out of the laptops, you know, get off the machines that we're doing our tax and email on. And as Byron likes to say, the co-founder of Mess, he always says that the, the the computer mouse is the least musical interface in the world, and that's where most music is being made. And I I fully agree with that statement. Um, so I think that yeah, I think that we need, we still need a lot of work opening people's ears up to the idea that, um, I mean, you know, John Cage was saying it so long ago, you know, it's like, it's like sometimes it's like the 20th century never happened, mm. right? So if, if, you, if you think about the 20th century aesthetically and philosophically, then basically we should all be able to do whatever we want whenever we want. It's all open, it's all available. But we're still kind of taught in, in institutions and by the culture and by the machinery that there's a very finite, you know, way to do things. So I'm, I'm heartened to hear you say it is opening up. I'm, I'm less convinced. I used to give a lecture at Monash University 20 years ago. Someone reminded me of it yesterday. But I, draw, I would draw a graph and I would draw one axis and I would say here's, here's the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And then there'd be one line on this axis and say here's Western diatonic music, you know? So this, this, this is the possibility and this is where we live, you know? And, and so, I, yeah. I, but, but I think that there is a, a greater... There is a greater receptiveness, I think, generally, um, but I still think there's more work to do. So, cool. I loved your optimism. I'm probably <laughs> a little bit less less optimistic, but it's certainly part of, as I said, the genre agnostic nature of mess is that anybody who comes in to make any kind of sound, we welcome everybody coming in to do whatever you want to do. You want to make handbag house bangers, unbelievable. Do it. Do it till the cows come home. It's cathartic and amazing, and it's wonderful music. You know, you want to make noise, come in and make noise. Just, you know, as long as you're doing it with the, with the creative spirit of generosity rather than antagonism, that's, that's also a very important distinction, to be making music in the world with, with love and respect rather than with, you know, the, the perverse idea that you need to, you know, break people's minds with it. I'm, I'm very attached to that idea as well. But. But I think that you know, as, as artists, we're all doing it. Basically, we're, you know, we're all in the in the in the world trying to encourage people to listen to ever broader and and more interesting uh, sound worlds. Not that the ones that exist aren't interesting, but I, I once had a conversation with a friend where I said, "We should all just stop making music because there's so much awesome music that exists. Right? You can have a lifetime of incredible listening, and no one needs to make anything new. Like, just stop. We should just stop and just enjoy what we have." And then he said to me, but, but imagine any point in history where you put that pin, you know? What if you, what if you never had the Beastie Boys, you know? What if you <laughs> never had, you know, some of these amazing things? Like, you put that pin anywhere and it doesn't make sense. And I really like that answer because it's, it's all about, you know, making new and wonderful things. I'll ask a really cheesy question. Um, what's your desert island synth and why? Each person, quickly, <laughs> Matt short Stone. round. Yeah. Oh, um, but, uh, AKS. As long as I've got a multi-track recorder to go with it, I'm happy as. <laughs> it's a desert island, yeah. <laughs> I need a generator. Can I get a generator? <laughs> and good monitors. Um, 808. I don't know, I, th I think <laughs> <laughs> something I could never afford. The, the Waldorf Quantum. <laughs> Is that that big? That's the big one. Yeah. That's just, it just came, Waldorf lent it to Mess recently and yeah. I played it for two minutes and then checked the price because I thought I need this in my studio and then I put that thought aside when I saw how much it was. But 
It's just an everything synth. You won't get. I guess the thing is, you want something that has a really thick manual because you want to be entertained. <laughs> you want to know that you're <laughs> occupied for the rest of your living days. That's a good point. The one with the thickest manual. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys have a favourite track, something that resonates with you the most? Do you, do you want to... Nicole? No, it changes every day, mm. <laughs> <laughs> depending on mood and... Um, uh, only because I just mentioned the TR-808. We don't have one up there, do we? No, no. Um, the classic roll and drum machine. Um, there have been artists like Richie Horton, I'm, th I'm thinking back in the day, who just r wrote... I'm a big fan of minimalism, I have mm. to say. Like, it just zeroing in on beautiful sounds and just making the best of that. And, and he wrote... He did entire albums just <laughs> based with this one drum machine. He had it modded, so it had all kinds of amazing uh, capacities to it. But um, So I would just say today's um, not just one track... Um, it would be, yeah, yeah, or or, uh, or um, respect to people who are doing their best with the very little stuff they had back in the day. And so Richie Horton's worth checking out. Plastic Man. There we go. I Plastic heard Man, that's yeah. the track, Plastic Man. Yeah. I heard uh, uh, Juan Atkins, um, a Cybertron track the other day, which I hadn't heard in a long time, and it reminded me of just what genius music that is from that, from that same era. Um, or uh, you know, kind of birth of, of techno. Um, but my favourite, my one, I'd probably go to like a Morton Subutnik recording and it would be either Sidewinder or um, uh, Sidewinder or The Wild Bull. We're cooked. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> that's the timer, so time's up. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't, I don't have to talk about my favourite track. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to choose either. But I, I, I will tell you, actually, this is quite funny. So my, my track changes every day as well. But at the moment, it's been about three weeks have been completely obsessed with Ordinary World by Duran Duran. Okay. And the reason for that I'm is that, is that I'm, I, go through, I go through these periods of drumming catharsis. So I have an electric drum kit at home. And I like to have stadium fantasies because that's all I ever really wanted to do was play the drums. <laughs> And Ordinary World is just so much fun to play that I've just been... It's just been on high repeat, high repeat, high repeat. And then there's a documentary on Netflix about this incredible psychopath who was a con man who convinced people to travel with him in really weird ways. And he actually had a, t a cassette. This is back in the 80s when it first came out. He had a cassette of Ordinary World that he would play on loop while he was hypnotising these people. So oh. it's quite diabolical as well. But that's my, that's my track yeah. of the moment. <laughs> But look, I'd really love to thank you all for coming down and being such a wonderful audience for us tonight. And uh, thanks to everybody who, who caught this on, online as well. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you.